Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I'm a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to be able to worship with you today. We gather, a community of faith in God's subversive world. We gather to celebrate that no darkness can extinguish light, to remember that love will always be more powerful than death, and to trust that peace will always be stronger than violence. We gather, people of faith in the light of God's world. Welcome to this time of worship. Please join me in prayer. Holy One of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who ransoms the souls of the faithful, sets the captives free, brings sight to the blind, and gives life to those who are perishing. Death has no victory over you or your kingdom. Evil slinks away from your presence. Rejoice, all you nations. Celebrate, all you peoples. Christ is Lord forever. His reign is unending. Amen. We begin with a reading from John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in it and saw the linens wraps pardon me the linen wrappings lying there but he did not go in then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take care of him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuani. Jesus said to her, do not touch me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said. So how do you feel about these words? In the words of the Easter Vigil, now that our Lenten observance is ended, are you greeting with great joy and enthusiasm the Paschal mystery? Or are you rejoicing that Lent is over and things can return to normal? Yes, we are happy that we can now rejoice and put to rest our particular Lenten discipline of this year, but that shouldn't really be the primary reason for our joy, should it? The life of great joy and freedom and peace should be our way of life, should it not? We are at Easter celebrating the most remarkable notion that humans have ever imagined. The great God, creator of the universe, has moved in time to change the rules. Death, as much as it is a part of the cycle of life that governs the created order, has now been nullified. Death has been conquered not simply for a show of power and might, but for a show of love. As John 3.16 reminds us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is truly amazing. Positively dumbfounding, wildly joyful. In the words of the prophet Jeremiah, this is the time that you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. As Easter, our joy is uncontainable. 
so much so that we begin to celebrate the new life that is ours in a particularly exuberant and outgoing way, for this begins the great season of Easter. But one might find it curious that we also pray these words at Easter. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. References to sin and death and reminders of our need to die daily to sin don't seem to be congruent with the joy of Easter. But the prayer does point us to the reality of our earthly life. Yes, we are an Easter people, a forgiven people, a people loved beyond measure. But we are also people who still must live in a world that is full of temptation and is fraught with peril. We live as a people with a vision that goes beyond this world, but that vision does not take us out of this world. That vision compels us back more deeply into the world in the midst of all its sin and death. To proclaim with the psalmist, on this day the Lord has acted, we will rejoice and be glad in it. In the Gospel reports of the events surrounding the resurrection of our Lord, we see the details of the reality of Mary Magdalene's reaction. We see her distress, even though this is exactly what the Twelve were told would happen, and we have no reason to believe that she did not know this as well. We are made privy to her distress and the bewildering grief that she experienced. Some might even sigh at her disbelief and apparent lack of comprehension of the miracle to which she is witness. But we see her very human emotions and can, in very real ways, understand her grief. Can't you imagine Mary stumbling through the garden, her tears making it difficult for her to see, anguish sobs racking her body? She looks into the tomb, hears the angel's question. Incidentally, these angels were apparently not there when Peter and the other disciple with whom Jesus loved entered the tomb. In her distress, she frantically answers that the body of her Lord has been taken, and then she turns around. With eyes swollen and flooded with tears, she is asked the same question and gives a similar answer. But then she hears his voice, the voice she did not recognize before, the voice she did not understand until it speaks her name. And then she is free of the grief and begins to feel the great joy that we are to feel this day and indeed our entire lives. Mary's reaction to the news and the process through which she goes in realizing what has taken place is very similar to our own process as we deal with the realities of our lives. We've heard the message of the gospel, we participate in the life of the church. We have an inkling of the promises that are ours through our relationship with Jesus. And we often lose our bearings and begin to despair. Ever-present sins, disappointments, and tragedies blind our sight and ability to see clearly the joy that is always ours. We cannot see through our tears as we stumble from place to place and even miss the wonder of visits from angels who ask us, why are we crying? We sob and wonder what could have possibly happened. We meet our Lord, but often don't hear his voice. We hear his words, but do not comprehend their meaning. We miss the possibility that it just might be true that the one for whom we are seeking is the one standing right in front of us. When we are in the middle of Lent, we find it hard to imagine Easter. Likewise, while we might intellectually understand the concept of resurrection, we can't quite believe it in the face of death and loss. Even though we intellectually understand the concept of forgiveness, we can't quite believe it in the midst of our sin and the sin around us. Even though Jesus tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us, we can't quite grasp and hold on to Jesus' presence when we feel alone. 
It's hard to remember the light when everything seems so dark. And yet, when we hear his voice, when we are able to hear him calling our names, it is then that we realize the truth of his word. It is then that we can lay hold to the promised joy. Yes, we live in a world so filled with noise that we can barely hear ourselves think. But our Savior's voice has the kind of quality that cuts through the cacophony. It is not loud or overbearing. It is persistent and sweet, patiently repeating our names in a wonderful repetition of love and peace. This world seems so filled with much that would seem to be bent on drawing us away from that sweet voice. We constantly have to be reminded to make the effort, day in and day out, to pay attention and strain to hear the voice of Jesus. Let this day and every day be one that is filled with the sound of Jesus' voice. Let our Savior's voice speak through the words of Scripture. Let our Savior's voice sing through the notes of the music. Let our Savior's voice call us gently and increase our joy with the, with the knowledge that all things have been accomplished and we are saved by Jesus' sacrifice and are able to trust in the reality of the resurrection. So if any of you are fearing, feeling weary from your Lenten journeys, please be encouraged on this day. Let your weariness, confusion, and doubt fall away. And if only for the balance of this day, rejoice and let your joy be known to all whom you meet. And if any need encouragement in this endeavor, remember the words of the old hymn. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing and the melody that he gives to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And now let us pray. O Christ, risen on this day the Lord has acted, we will rejoice and be glad in it. In the midst of the darkness and fear in this world, let us revel in the divine light of your glorious resurrection. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. O Christ, risen, lavish your healing grace and hope upon all who are ailing in body, mind, or spirit, and all who give them daily care. O Christ risen, our grateful hearts commend those we love, who have risen with you into the heavenly peace and splendor of life everlasting. O Christ risen, especially in these uncertain times, grant ever-increasing amounts of prudence, integrity of purpose, compassion, and mercy to the political leaders of this earth, this nation, and this community. Holy Redeemer Christ, resurrected in glory, in dying you destroyed our mortal death, in rising you claimed salvation for our souls. Release us from temporal distractions that entomb us in this earthly life, and set us again on the path to your true and eternal life in you. We ask through the Holy Spirit, the divine breath of new life, and our merciful and partial Creator, who together with you are the one God in glory, boundless and everlasting. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Good morning, friends. This is Pastor George from the Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle right here in Chetwin. And it pleases me a great deal to bring to you today a message about Easter. Uh, it's the time of the year when we reflect upon the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust your heart will be blessed as I speak with you from God's Word. I want to read just a couple of verses from St. John's Gospel, chapter 19. And uh, beginning to read at verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed 
And so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to the lips of Jesus. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Today I just want to talk about the cry of triumph. Jesus said, It is finished. The victim has become the victor. The Savior's sufferings are now over. His work on earth is done, and the gates to heaven are now open for any man, woman, or young person who would, look, who would like to put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Jesus said, it is finished, what really did it mean? I just want to bring very briefly three things to your mind. Number one, it meant that all of the prophecies connected with his life and his death are now finished. It was actually hundreds of years before Christ was born. Prophecy had declared that he would be born of a woman, that he would be a descendant of David, that he would be named even before he was born, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would flee to Egypt, that he would have a forerunner in the person of John the Baptist. It was prophesied that he would cause the lame to walk and the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. All of this was now completed when Jesus said, it is finished. It was prophesied that he would be despised, that he would be rejected of men, and he would be hated without a cause, that he would be betrayed by his closest friends, and that he would be forsaken by even his disciples. It was prophesied that he would be led as a person to a slaughter, that he would be numbered amongst the transgressors, and that the soldiers would gamble for his garments. But now he cries, it is finished. Up to that point, the prophecies have been fulfilled. Number two, when he cried, it is finished, it meant that his suffering is now finally over. He was called the man of sorrows. No one ever had more of a fitting title than Jesus, for he suffered at the hands of men. He suffered at the hands of Satan, and even on the cross, when he felt that his Father God had left him alone, Jesus had suffered. God bruised him and forsook him on that cross because on the shoulders of the Lord Jesus Christ was placed the sins of the whole world. His friends, his enemies, inflicted pain upon him. Someone had painted a picture of Jesus when he was but a boy, standing in the carpenter's shop against the open window. He stretches out his arms, and the shadow on the far wall projected that of a cross. And so Jesus lived under the shadow of the cross. It was always the shadow. It was always there. He went to a wedding feast at Canaan. Everything was happy. There was gladness. There was laughter. And yet at one point, with referencing to his death, he said, my time has not yet come. And thus the shadow of the cross. Why, even Nicodemus came to him by night and and Jesus 
spoke to him. Jesus talked with him. And Jesus talked about him being lifted up from the earth and drawing all people to him. Again, there is a shadow of the cross. When James and John had spoken to Jesus about high places of honor in his kingdom, Jesus had to speak to them about the cup of suffering and the baptism of sorrow. Peter had confessed that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus had to tell them then that he must go up to Jerusalem and be killed. Again, there is the shadow of the cross. And if Jesus had suffered under the shadow of the cross, think of what he suffered from the real thing, from the real event of crucifixion. In the prime of his young manhood, his hour comes. He goes into Gethsemane. He fights the battle. And he comes out of that prayer with victory and says to Father God, not my will, but thine be done. He appears four times at an unjust trial. He is arrested without cause. They scourge him. They buffet him. They spit upon him. And then they crown him with thorns. Imagine Jesus, the innocent one, Jesus, the Son of God, being tortured in this kind of a way. And soon he is on his way to the cross, to Golgotha. He is nailed there. And the cross is raised and Jesus hangs between earth and heaven. And from earth the people jeer and taunt him. And from heaven darkness is descended. And it is as if God turns his back upon his son. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But now the suffering is all over, both physical and spiritual. Because Jesus, when he cries out, it is finished, the cup has been drained. The storm of God's wrath is spent. The darkness is ended and the wages of sin have been paid and the law is satisfied. All the shame and all the suffering and agony are past. Never again will Jesus experience such excruciating shame. Never again will he be cruelly treated by human hands. Never again will God turn his back upon his son. For all of his sufferings are over. And as we think of all the agony and suffering of the cross, it ought to be cause for us to love him more and more and remember that he suffered for our sake. And so when he said it is finished, all the prophecies had been fulfilled, all of the sufferings are over, and number three, our redemption is now made possible. There are three persons in the Godhead, as the Christian church would believe, and each of the three would have a definite task, but yet they work jointly. God the Father is especially concerned with the government of the world in a general sense and even in a specific sense. He rules all the works that His hands had created. God the Son is especially interested in the work of our redemption. He came into the world to die for sinners, and that includes me. God, the Holy Spirit, especially interested in the Scriptures 
And he moved men and women to write the Bible. And the Holy Spirit interprets it into our heart. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working as one makes it possible for you and I to be redeemed from sin and brought into a relationship with God the Father. Now the cross of Christ has finished His work. On that cross, it is finished. God created the heavens and the earth, and at the end of it, God felt in His heart, and God could say, my creation is finished, and it's all good. Christ died upon the cross only after He had completely finished the work of redemption. No one will ever have to add anything in order to be saved. He had looked upon the work that he had done, and he said, it is finished. I have completed my task. It is done. It was a word of accomplishment. It was a word of victory. And the Old Testament says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now it is done. He has borne our sins, and our redemption is complete. My prayer to you during this Easter season is that Christ will become alive in your heart, and you will be redeemed by the precious blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. God bless you. Let me just pray with you for a moment. Father, bless those who are listening today. And if there are those who perchance are facing difficulties in their life, or they're not into a relationship with God personally, I pray today that this Easter season, they will reach out in faith and claim Christ as their Savior. Have a great day, and God bless you. Amen. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone in the community for coming out today. We're celebrating a momentous occasion here in Chetwin. Chetwin General Hospital is turning 50 today. 50 years ago today, the doors first opened to this community. And so I want to thank everyone who's come out to celebrate today and to also thank the staff and the community from the past present and going into the future, I'm sure we'll be having another celebration like this. While it is raining today, there's no dampening the spirits of our community and our staff as we have had a wonderful turnout here today to celebrate the 50 years of the Chetwin Hospital being open. Just remember me, I'll remember.